Hey, what's up garden friends? Jeff here, how's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. I'm great and pruning on my hydrangeas. I had to do some cleanup on those, sat down at the table, strip them off, move them into some fresh water, get them cleaned up. I thought this would be a good time to go ahead and do part two of a video that I said I'd do a part two to in uh, 2021. Better wait than never, right? I'm not great at holding still. So since this is a task where I'm just gonna be sitting here and plucking leaves off of things, Seemed like an opportune time for me, because I'm being selfish, to go through the second part of that list. I'm gonna jump right into it here. There are a few things to make sure to mention before going into the list. I know when I'm watching a video that's a list style, I generally just want to know the deets. Give me the plants. I've got like 21, 22 plants on here. Probably going to end up being more along the lines of, I would guess, 25. I guess some of the plants are, you know, just a specific type of plant, but there might be a lot of different options within that group to grow. Unlike like the first list, a lot of these I don't have to show here in my garden. So that's why I'm sitting here instead of walking around. I'm just going to be putting things up on the screen. Some of them I do have, but they're in my front yard, which don't show just, you know, internet safety, not show the front of the house. I have grown everything though, except for like two of the plants. I'm going to have to whip through them fairly quickly because there are a lot. Don't need this video to be two hours long. I'll give some detail pictures. If it's something that strikes your interest and you have the name and everything, you can go look them up, read more about them, see if maybe it's the plant that you're into. And these are in no specific order. I should have mentioned that too. Starting off, number one, hardy orchids. There are a lot to choose from. You have your botillas, which have a nice grass-like foliage on them. The flowers come in various shades of whites and pinks. Some have yellows, some have spotting. They tend to be pretty hardy. A lot of them are hardy into zone five. Those are probably the most sturdy and common of the various types of the hardy orchids. Then there are the Aclenthe orchids, which most are for zone seven and up. But there are a few for zone six. The thicker, more strap-like leaf on them. The flowers come up on a nice long stalk. They usually have that heavy saturation in color that I'm more used to seeing with orchids along the petals and the throats of the flowers. And then Cypripediums, which are hardy lady slipper orchids. These are not for new growers. It's something to do a lot of research on. They require a level of dedication or perfect conditions. It can be expensive and they're oftentimes poached. So if you're searching to buy some, try and find some from somebody who can verify that they've been seed grown or tissue cultured, whatever the case is. You don't want them to be ripped out of the wild. The flowers come in lots of different colors. There are various sizes that you can expect out of the flowers on the foliage is pretty interesting as well. And there are a lot of different types of hardy orchids to choose from and some of them are going to be native to your states or wherever you live. It's good to plant native when you have a chance, right? Those are just the three most common, easiest to find of hardy orchids. There are a lot of orchids you can grow in really almost any zone. You can probably find an orchid that you can grow, but as far as ones that have more of a floral interest or a foliar interest. Those are the ones that I think people will have the best luck getting a hold of. Number two is a tree, a small tree. The Carolina Sweetheart Redbud has gorgeous variegated foliage on it that to me is nearly identical to the variegated sea hibiscus, which is one that I've talked about a lot. I have one, I have both of these plants actually. The Carolina Sweetheart Red Bud, the, the variegation is going to shift on it depending on the amount of light they get and soil conditions, I think may have an influence, but I haven't read anything to confirm that. It's a smaller, slower growing red bud, but the variegation on them is just fantastic. It's really a standout plant when it has the bright, vibrant variegation on it. During the hottest parts of the summer, that variegation will wash out to just more of a greenish leaf with some red tones in it. It's not as impressive, but when things cool off again, the pop comes right back out. You get to see more of that show with them. Number three, this is a wishlist plant of mine. I don't have one. I would really like to get one. And that's the Euphorbia mercenides, which is a blue donkey tail spurge. Evergreen succulent, good for zones five and up and well-drained soil. They put out an 18 inch long growth that is reminiscent to the uh, burrow's tail, donkey tail, very common succulent plant that a lot of people like to grow as a house plant. Well, this gives you a similar vibe that you can have outside. And they get a nice little cluster of flowers that hangs off of their ends. This is a euphorbia, so be careful with the sap and everything. Make sure to wear gloves or wash your hands after you've been messing with it. You can really mess your eyes up and your pets can get sick, anybody who eats them. Not the safest of plants to have around. Oh, I already did this one. Look at that, good for me. Number four, cast iron plants, which are the Aspidistras. Cast iron plants, they get that name for a reason. They're 
sturdy, like iron. These are plants that can live a very, very, very long time. Most of them are hardy for zone eight and up. Some of them are considered more tropical, but there are plenty that can be grown in zone seven. And a lot of the ones that can be grown in zone seven, you can overwinter in zone six with a good layer of mulch and a nice sheltered location. They have that nice long strap-like leaf, kind of like a Sansevieria or what's now Dracaena, but you get what I'm saying, the snake plants. During more wild winters, they'll be evergreen in zone six too, may have some winter dieback on them. Some of them are much more slow to get going, so there are plants that take a good amount of patience when you get them into the ground, but I think it's well worth the wait for what you end up getting from these plants over time. They'll fill out a dry, shady area very well, and it gives a very exotic appeal. You have this field of really cool looking, just giant blades of beautiful foliage. Some of my favorites are the uh, gold feather, which is a 7B and up, but I do think in a nice sheltered location, throw some mulch on it. It should be fine and come back when the weather gets warm again, if they die back to the ground. And as far as ones that are hardy to zone 7A, which means probably good in zone six, if you give them a really heavy mulch, is the snow cap, which has really fun white variegation on the tips of the leaves. And then the same thing with the Asahi, which is another 7A and up, has a more subtle, wider variegation, like a little streak of white on the very ends of the foliage. And number five, this is where things could very easily go off the rails and I could end up talking for another 20 minutes about one plant, so I'm not going to do that. Voodoo lilies, gonna keep that nice and broad. Sword made them venosum, konjac, Draconcolis vulgaris. There are a lot of different types of voodoo lilies. The appeal to them is they all have pretty neat, exotic looking foliage on them that can fill in an area and you get a neat little field of just bizarre looking leaves and they put up a really cool flower on them as well usually a stinky flower but it's a cool one you guys should comment down below if you have a favorite type put that down in the comment section so that people can look those up i will have had them up on the screen so there's some reference to go by but there are tons of them it's i don't think i can pick out just one to give as an example it's gonna be the same for a few of these plants actually it feels so weird to just gloss over plants that are so cool but like i said the video would be hours long if i were to go into too much detail on each one of these that's the point of a list right you kind of got to gloss over things give a nice long list and people can do the whole googly thing if they want to number six impatience one impatient specifically and that's the impatience omaniana silver pinkster specifically has gorgeous foliage on it really pretty exotic looking it has the same shape that you get with a lot of impatience has a lot of color in it and they're perennial for i believe zone five and up they'll spread and fill in an area in the front of a shady garden really really well i think it's a plant a lot of people will enjoy though they do tend to go dormant during the heat of the summer yeah. number seven arums another just broad group just like with the voodoo lilies they have really cool foliage there are a lot of different types to choose from a lot of them like boggy conditions they have that really nice alocasia colocasia big heart-shaped aeroidy leaves that we all usually associate with a tropical type of garden that's the same thing with number eight which are peltandras another group of plants just like with the arums lots of really interesting foliage that usually has a high gloss to it and is also very reminiscent of the foliage you see on the alocasias and colocasias, aeroids in general. Have to do your research on the arums. Some types will go dormant during the summer and they'll be more active to grow during the winter time, which I think is pretty cool that you can have some really neat exotic looking foliage outside in your garden when everything else is just blech and sad looking. And the arums, number seven, and the peltandras, number eight, have really cool looking aeroidy flowers pretty much all the aeroids are gonna have those neat flowers on them. They fill up with really colorful berries on the inside. They're not berries, don't eat them. That's not what I should have said, but they're beautiful and fun to look at. Number nine, the uh, yellow bird of paradise tree, hardy bird of paradise tree. Listed as hardy to zone seven and up, they will be more of a deciduous plant when you go into zone six. There are reports of them in zone five. Longest I've ever been able to grow one here in my 6B garden was about three, maybe four years is how long I was able to have it. We had a really bad ice storm that ended up killing it back. That could be prevented by covering the plant to keep the ice off of it, I suppose. Did return from the ground, but it was never anything particularly special and I got rid of it. But I think it's worth a try if you really like the flowers on the bird of paradise trees. It's really fun, textured, mimosa-like, but on a more small, compact looking plant that has a really nice growth habit and structure to it. Okay, number 10, I need to go get some more flowers. I got a lot more cutting to do over here. Number 10, 
Musella laziocarpa. In the last video, I talked about bananas, kept it pretty broad. I should have homed in on this particular banana because they're good into zone five with some mulch in a proper location, right? Don't want to stick them out in the open in a muddy soil where they'll just freeze rock solid during the winter time. In zone five, that is. In zone five and zone six. If you live colder than zone eight, they're likely to die back to the ground during the winter time. Maybe zone seven, zone eight might be a little bit conservative, but they come back with just really nice, long, more of a thin bladed banana leaf. And you're not really growing these for the trunks. You're growing them for that foliage. It's kind of like if you were to cross the banana with a canna and they give you a hint of bird of paradise vibes just as far as the foliage goes and they're one of the ones that's more likely to flower for you because they have a shorter duration of time that's needed for them to produce an inflorescence and the flower that comes out on them is a nice cool looking big yellow just glob of like banana madness banana-esque madness and they do stay relatively small but they will fill in in areas i would expect them to go anywhere from probably four and a half feet up to about seven feet high and wide of just leaves, really neat looking leaves. And they are very cold hardy. So it's one that I would say is definitely worth giving a try. Okay, I went and reloaded. There's so many hydrangeas out here that need to be pruned. This is not the point of the video. What's the next one? Number 11, Manfredas. More specifically, Manfreda virginica. It's a cold hardy, nice succulent plant. They have really interesting flowers on them. It is one of the parents of the mangaves, which are a really popular plant, both for houseplants and outdoors. They have that awesome rosette shape that we like to see with agaves and bromeliads and just a lot of tropical looking plants in general. They're really sturdy plants too, great for a rock garden. It's not so much the case now, but back in the day, there were a few different types, a few different varieties of the virginicas that you could find that had interesting foliage on them. I don't really see those around anymore. Mostly I'm just happy if I can find the Virginica, which are hardy into zone five. That's a fun one that I would recommend giving a try. It's a great one if you want that bromeliad type appearance or an agave type appearance, but you don't want to mess with moving plants in and out of the house or covering up agaves during the winter time to keep them dry. Virginica is a good way to go. Number 12 and 13 and 14 are fairly similar plants, but I'm still gonna break them down separately. They all give a lot of the same appeal. Number 12, Ligularias. They have nice, bold, cupped foliage. Most of them are pretty hardy, well into zone five. You just gotta look up the different types for your zone. The foliage has varying degrees of texture and color and glossiness. Some of them are nice, stiff foliage that looks really, really neat. And a lot of them put up a nice flower in the fall time that looks really pretty. It's the Ligularias, you also get the Farfugium, so you can look both of those up. When it's labeled a Farfugium, they tend to have a more glossy foliage on them and usually are not quite as cold hardy. So it is one you have to do some research on, figure out which ones are good for your zone, but they're usually a lot to choose from for zones five and up. Number 13 is one that I've never grown, but I've always wanted to, and those are the Darmeras. Also known as the umbrella plants, they tend to prefer a more cool climate. So not one that I'm aware of doing great where I live. If I could ever get my hands on one, then it's something that I would certainly give a try. I'd like to see how they would do. You can probably see from the pictures up here on the screen, again, it's that really nice, big, neat looking cupped umbrella-like foliage. It's big, bold, impactful foliage. That's what draws me to a lot of plants when I want them to stand out and give that tropical exotic vibe to the garden. Darmera peltata, that is, I should be more specific there. That really big, cupped umbrella-like foliage that's got some serrations in there, heavy veining. They give a vibe to a Ganera, but they will be a little bit smaller. I just haven't heard a lot of great things about trying to grow them in places with really hot and humid summers. But if anybody has had success with that, you live someplace in the upper south or in the south and they've done well for you, comment down below, let us know. I could clump Ganera and Darmera together as number 13 but I'm not going to do that because Ganeras typically are not as cold hardy, but they have a very similar vibe, much bigger leaves. The Darmera should be good into zone five, six, somewhere in there, I believe. Like I said, that's one of the ones that I haven't grown, but I've always wanted to and thought it was a really cool looking plant. Oh no, I lost count. The Ligulars were 12, Darmeras were 13. Moving on to number 14, Pampas grass. Pampas grass, sorry. Takes up a lot of space, but holy freaking foliage. That is a plant that is a very impactful structure to it. Mostly known for the gigantic seed heads that flow in the wind beautifully, almost like giant ostrich feathers. But I think even when they're not in flower, they're still really nice looking 
ornamental grasses because they tend to keep a really good circular shape to their growth. It's really good for that coastal vibe. There's one that I like and would like to try, but I don't know where I would put it, that is called the Blue Bayou. The reason I like Blue Bayou is because it's supposed to be a more compact version of a pampas grass. Pampas grass, they can be absolutely just gigantic. Also should have mentioned most of them are for zone seven and up, but the Blue Bayou is good for zone six B. A lot of people here in zone six grow the pampas grass. I think a lot of it just has to do with where you situate the plants. It's a common plant to see in zone six. So I'm not sure why they, well, they used to be, I actually haven't looked into it recently. They used to be commonly listed as a zone seven that may have changed over the years. Not something that I see people planting that much these days. It used to be really common. Pampas grass was at all the nurseries, but I guess that that fad wore out. Oh yeah, but that was the appeal with the blue bio is that it's more compact than just your regular pampas grass, but still 10 foot wide clump. They need a good amount of space. They still have that giant, really neat looking seed heads on them that I think is what makes them so cool and so fun to grow. Great plant for that more beachy vibe. People may want more of a jungly vibe. So number 15, reed grass. Arunda dunnox. There are a few different types you can grow that's just really tall canes of grass. Something that needs a lot of space, but it makes a very bold statement, similar to a clump of bananas. Good option for water gardens. They can be grown marginally in the ponds, along your ponds, and they are a great plant to put out for privacy too. There's one called peppermint stick that I really like. I had years ago and then I didn't have enough sun for it anymore, so it died. The trees ended up growing and it died. Variegated foliage on it, which is interesting to see in a plant that so big and stately. Maybe you don't want something that's really big and crazy. Maybe you want something more fine and delicate looking. Number 16, ferns. Don't know why ferns didn't make my first list. Ferns can be used in every type of garden. And if you choose the right types, like the tongue ferns or some of the evergreen ferns that have more of a stiff, glossy foliage on them, tuck them into various cracks and crevices. By doing that, you get a really nice tropically, jungly vibe. That's one of the fun things about ferns is you can use them for fine detail and it can really be transformative to an area. I think they make things look more settled and less intentional and more random, depending on how you use your ferns, right? There are a lot to choose from. Comment down below, let us know some of your favorite ferns. For 17, this isn't one everybody's going to be able to grow, but it's a fun one. Those are these Saracenias. It's your pitcher plants. They need a boggy area. They don't want to be into a compact soil. It really needs to be a nice peaty area. It's one to do some research on, just like with the first thing on the list, the Cypripedium orchids. But if you have an area where you can grow them, it's well worth it. They come in all different shapes and sizes and colors. It's a fun plant to have around that gives a very exotic look. You can set up an entire edge of a garden into a bog with these things and they will fill out and just look phenomenal. Otherworldly when you really get a lot of variety in there. Some of the big really monstrous types. Number 18. Hear me out on this one. Kind of going in the same direction as I was with the ferns which can be used in lots of different garden settings. All of these can but I think hostas are an excellent plant to give a tropical vibe. You just gotta get the right type and use them the right way. The Summon Substance has gigantic foliage on it. There are a few from Proven Winners now, I don't remember the names of them, that also have really big, bold, impressive foliage. And there are some smaller ones that have really nice coloration on them that stand out in an area and uh, to me look very exotic. While they can be used in a more formal structure, really, I mean, if you want to use them in an English garden, cottage garden, you can use hosses in all different ways. I can talk about hosses for a long time, but they're also a great option if you want something to give that tropical vibe. Rainbow's End or Rainbow's Edge is a great one. There are some that have more of a thin foliage on them. Again, ton to choose from with the hosta, so comment down below what some of your favorites are. I will have had my favorites up on the screen. Then whatever I've had up on the screen, I should have mentioned that in the beginning. Whatever I've had up on the screen are more than likely my favorites of those types with plants like hosses and ferns, the orchids, plants that there are a lot to choose from. If it was up on the screen, then that's probably the type that I like the most or would suggest. Seems way easier to do it that way than give a specific rundown on every different type of each one of these groups of plants, right? Number 19, passion flowers. Passiflora incarnata, the maypop, native to a lot of states, native here in Missouri. That's a great option. The cerulea, which is just the blue crown passion flower, a common passion fine. They are listed as zone seven and up, but I have them come back for me in zone six all the time when I plant them as an annual. Just gotta watch your microclimate and stick them in a location that's sheltered and 
stays nice and warm during the winter. Might need to mulch it just to be safe. In fact, a lot of the passion flowers that are listed for zone seven, you can give a try in zone six. I think it'd be worth a shot. Just make sure to mulch them, situate them in a spot with well draining soil that's not blasted by cold weather and they should be okay. As far as the zone six and seven ones are concerned, that is. Incense, a nice purple leaf flower, smells great. I would give that one a try. I've had that come back for me in zone six before. Number 20, you're gonna have to hear me out on this one too. Semper Vivum, which is a hens and chicks. It's a specific Semper Vivum, Semper Vivum El Toro. Semper Vivums are hens and chicks, really cold hardy, sturdy plants. The El Toro is one that gets a seven inch rosette on it that looks much more like an echeveria when they get to that size. They have really colorful foliage on them. It's a nice sturdy plant, just like with most sempervivums. This one's supposed to be better for hot, humid climates or places with hot, humid summers. Imagine pairing that with that donkey tail spurge. If you have an area with a slope, have the sempervivum up high with that donkey tail spurge running down below it. It'd be a, pr oh, I didn't mean to do that. It's like a perennial succulent planter. It'd be around all year. They're mostly evergreen too. It's a really cool Semper Vivum, one that I think that is worth giving a try. I did have one that did not make it through this past winter, unfortunately. We had, well, the whole country, most of the country had that really bad Arctic blast and uh, apparently going from being in the 50s to being like negative 10 degrees, which is too much for the plants. Okay, and last but not least, number 21. Really more like number 25, because I named off like three different plants for some of these, but whatever. Oh, and I have this one. We can go look at this one. Chinese fan palms. In the first part, the other video, I talked about hardy palms, mostly said sable minor, needle palms, and I kept it very conservative, because I don't want to tell people that they can grow something that's going to require a lot of work to overwinter and then call it hardy. There are a lot of palm trees people are growing in zone six and zone seven that would not normally grow there, but you do the heat cables and the mulch and wrap them heavily with burlap. Some people put lots of protection over the tops of them, build entire structures around them. That's cool, but I wouldn't call that cold hardy. That's not the point of these videos. I would say if you can put it in a spot that's situated well with good drainage and a nice warm microclimate, maybe you have to cut it back and put mulch on it. We'll call that cold hardy. But otherwise, I think the other plants would be better saved for a different kind of video. Chinese fan palm, back on point here, excellent option. These can die down to the ground in the wintertime, throw a bag of mulch on them, and when things get nice and warm the next year, they'll pop back up. I usually have to hit the areas where I overwinter my Chinese fan palms. I haven't done this in several years, but a long time ago I had Chinese fan palms scattered throughout the garden and in the springtime. Once the ground temperatures were generally in the 60s, I would start fertilizing the area where the fan palms are with a root stimulating fertilizer just to help kick them into gear. And then when things get nice and warm, usually around early June, late May, they start putting up just nice, big, glossy, fan-shaped leaves. It's a great plant to have around. Hey, baby, how you doing? You used to be able to get them for very affordable prices. You could get Chinese fan palms from your big box store for like eight bucks. That's not really the case anymore. I can usually find them about this size for like 20 to 30 bucks. And I say that's worth a try. You can toss them in the garden. All you have to do is throw a bag of mulch on But when I say throw a bag of mulch on them, I need to be more specific. Cut them back right around the time you're going to have some frost or a little bit after the frost. The whole plant to the ground, crown and everything. If they have a really big developed crown, you can leave that, but wrap some cloth around it just to be safe to help keep some moisture out of the middle of it. And then I like to go eight to 12 inches above that crown with mulch and a good foot and a half wide ring around the entire plant. And that's usually all it takes in zone six to overwinter the Chinese fan palms. They'll come back just like a colocasia would. Canna, any of those plants, but with much, much, much different foliage. If you're to plant a row of them, it looks really cool. The only problem is you end up having to wait a fairly long time to get that nice impactful foliage because they don't come up until it's nice and warm. Then you have to wait several weeks longer after that for them to look really good. So by midsummer, they're usually looking pretty good. You want to make sure you're regular with the fertilizer to help encourage that growth and get them moving. And yeah, that's everything. I hope that that was useful, helpful in some way, shape, or form. There are a lot of plants that could have made the list. Comment down below if you have more suggestions. Remember, there was a part one, so something you may suggest might have been in that part one. The description for that video has all of the plants time stamped down below. I'll try and do the same thing with this one. And maybe in the future can talk about 
plants that are surprisingly cold hardy that might require more protection. That Chinese fan palm kind of borders into that area. The thermometer just popped up on the screen, meaning this thing's about to overheat. Good timing, because I only have one flower left to go. This has been great for making time pass with a task that I find to be mind-numbingly boring. Don't ask me questions about cut flowers. I don't know. That's why it's not a topic of a video. These were just plants that needed to be pruned, so clean them up, stick them in some water, and enjoy them in the house for a while. May end up drying some of the paniculata flowers. That came out looking surprisingly nice, considering I wasn't paying attention to all to what I was doing, other than stripping the leaves off and cutting the ends on most of them. I forgot with some of them. Hope everybody's doing well, having a great day, a great life, and everything's just going absolutely beautifully for you. And of course, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Hey, Terps. Hey, Doombibi. Bye-bye.